Hello, this is Dr. Gerald Dirks, formerly the Reverend Gerald Dirks. In just a few moments, here on The Dean Show, we'll be talking about my conversion to Islam. Please, don't go away. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, which is a greeting of peace. Peace be unto you. Welcome to another episode of The Dean Show, where we're here trying to help you understand Islam and Muslims. And when we come back, we have a very special guest who was a former Christian minister. He has graduated with honors from the prestigious Harvard University with a master's in divinity started studying the Bible at a very young age he has so much to share with us today on the Dean Show and I'm so excited to have him here with us so you don't want to go nowhere we're going to be talking to Dr. Gerald Dirks when we come back here on the Dean Show you don't want to go nowhere we'll be right back Allah, there's only one God and Muhammad is his messenger. Allah, la ilaha illallah. Allah, there's only one God and Jesus was his messenger. Allah, la ilaha illallah. I don't know why I did that. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just to break the ice. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. How are you, brother? Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and visit us here at the Dean Show. Oh, it's my pleasure, brother. We uh, have got to uh, mention a few things about you. Uh, you were actually a former minister, a deacon? Ordained deacon in the United Methodist Church. And you have a master's degree in divinity from Harvard. University from Harvard Divinity School, correct? Wow, this is uh, and and the list goes on. You uh, were a uh, preacher at, at many, starting at a young age. You worked as a youth minister, ordained minister, and the list goes on. Uh, you, we have some books also here that you have uh, authored. Yes, we're going to uh, mention a few of the books here. You have uh, the a Abraham, the friend of God, which uh, is this book here. Well, it's actually the Abrahamic faiths. The, a the Abrahamic faiths. You have uh, Easy to Understand Islam. It's another book here. We have uh, Muslims in America, the history. Yeah. And you have uh, Letters to My Elders in Islam. Yes. You have Understanding Islam. Now, you've wrote, written a lot of books on Islam and the Crescent and the Cross. Yeah, the Cross and the Crescent. Yes. You like to write, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, these are some of your books that you've authored, you, you're obviously uh, very busy writing books, you, you, you uh, uh, are out there uh, trying to now uh, uh, mend the bridges, uh, build the bridges to help develop a better understanding be between Islam, uh, the Muslims and people of other faiths. Yes. But we want to hear about your story. We want to know why would someone who was so high up in the ranks, who had so much knowledge of Christianity, you know the Bible well, what happened? Let's talk from your, we'll get a little bit of a history from a young age. Talk to us. Tell us how you uh, got involved in, in Christianity and your parents and etc. Sure. Actually, there's probably four parts to the story. Yes. And the first part would be sort of my journey into the Christian ministry. Yeah. The second part would be my leaving the ministry. Mm -hmm. Third part would be my years as what I called an atypical Christian. Yeah. And then finally, the fourth part, my journey into Islam. Mm -hmm. But you ask about the first part, which mm -hmm. is my sort of journey in, to the Christian ministry. Yeah. I grew up in a small rural community in Kansas where the church was the center of community life. Uh, it was a small town of about 500 people. We had three churches. Uh, every summer there were... Uh, ice cream socials at the churches, chicken pot pie dinners, mm -hmm. corn roasts, etc. Mm -hmm. And the churches really were the center of community life. And that was true for my family as well. Mm -hmm. We attended the local Methodist church and uh, throughout my childhood uh, I was very actively involved in collecting my perfect attendance pens from Sunday school, mm -hmm. my awards for memorizing biblical verses, etc. And so by the time I reached junior high school, uh, I was already considering the ministry as a personal calling. And about that time, uh, during the annual Youth Sunday, 
uh, I was always selected to deliver the sermon. And word of that got around, and before long I was preaching at various other local churches upon occasion, at nursing homes, at various church-affiliated organizations, etc. How old was this at? Uh, I was probably uh, about uh, 14 wow, when this started. Very, very young age. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I continued in that direction. And at age 17, I entered Harvard College as an undergraduate uh, with a philosophy uh, major, which was gearing towards seminary, mm -hmm. and uh, continued on in that direction. In 1970, uh, actually 1969, I received my license to preach mm -hmm. from the United Methodist Church. In 1971, graduated uh, as an undergraduate and entered uh, Harvard Divinity School, which is a three-year program leading to a degree in uh, Master of Divinity. In 1972, I was ordained a deacon in the United Methodist Church, and in 1974, uh, I graduated with a Master of Divinity from uh, uh, Harvard Divinity School. Mm -hmm. Spent that summer as an interim minister in two rural parishes in Kansas. But in the fall of 1974, I left the ministry, mm -hmm. or at least left the parish ministry. I was still an ordained minister, but uh, never again would I uh, fill a pulpit after the fall of 1974. Which probably brings us to the second part of the story, if you want to move in that direction. Yeah, t tell us, what, will you go into that? Why did you end up, I mean, you were filling the pulpits. I mean, did you have like a big crowd? People would be excited to come listen to you preach. And did you guys have a band? How did that work to describe <laughs> this, this atmosphere? Oh, uh, well, at, at the risk of sounding immodest. Yeah. Uh, typically, everywhere I, I preach, we set attendance records. You were like a Jimmy Swagger at the time? Oh, of your, no, of no, your, no, of your, no, I, I mean, please don't do that. <laughs> of, of your community, maybe a Joe Osteen of, of the, the small little town? Or well, I, I, I don't want to <laughs> do, do comparisons, but yeah. uh, suffice it to say, uh, attendance typically skyrocketed Oh, uh, nice. when, when uh, I was behind the pulpit. So people knew who you were? Yes. They wanted, your, they wanted a ticket to get into this uh, uh, church to see and to hear what you had to say, because you had knowledge. You were a man of knowledge. Uh, amongst other things, yeah. Okay, so talk to us now from filling the pulpits, people lined up wanting to hear what you had to say from preaching the Bible. What now led you to leave the pulpit? Well, when people ask me, mm -hmm. I, I usually say there's a long story and a short story. Yes. The short story is a good seminary education. The long story takes a little longer. Mm -hmm. But basically, it's one of the ironies of life that the churches often take the uh, most promising of their young ministers and they send them to really good seminaries. And in those really good seminaries, such as the one I was fortunate enough to attend, you are systematically exposed to the oldest existing texts of how the Bible actually once read. You're exposed to the changes that were made in those texts, when those changes took place, why those changes took place, where mm -hmm. those changes took place. Um, so once you receive that knowledge, and those changes, by the way, raise serious, serious questions mm -hmm. about such fundamental Christian doctrines as the Trinity, the sonship of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, uh, the crucifixion event, and uh, the doctrine of atonement and the blood. All of these come into serious question when you look at the oldest manuscripts that we have of what the Bible once said. So that was one consideration. The other consideration is that you are also given a very good grounding in the history of the early church. Now this is seminary school. Yes. Is this at, when, it, when, when does now seminary school come? Is that that's after Harvard now? Well, first you do the undergraduate. I did okay. four years undergraduate at Harvard. Okay. Received my BA. Yes. And then entered Harvard Divinity School, which is a seminary. Yes. And that's a three-year course of studies leading to a Master of Divinity. Okay, gotcha. So the, the second thing you're exposed to is the actual history of the early Christian church. And in terms of that, 
you're, you're exposed to the decidedly geopolitical machinations that really went into defining some of the fundamental doctrines and dogmas of Christianity. And, and notice I said geopolitical machinations, not theological considerations, mm -hmm. not religious considerations, but political considerations that went in. You're also exposed to the tremendous breadth of knowledge, the tremendous breadth of opinion that existed within early Christianity. You know, it was not monolithic. This is, is this kind of like the Christian fic? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> suffice it to say there were many different branches yeah. to early Christianity. Mm -hmm. Now, the branch that survived basically into modern times was Pauline Christianity. Mm -hmm. Uh, this was the Christianity that developed out of the teachings of Paul or, or Saul of Tarsus. This is what's mainstream today? Yes, basically. Okay. Yeah. But there were many other branches to early Christianity, mm -hmm. some of which survived for centuries mm -hmm. before they eventually died out. And one of the fundamental distinctions that uh, we can make is between Pauline Christianity, which was the Christianity that Paul took to the Gentiles and the non-Jews, principally in Europe, but also to a certain extent in Asia Minor. And we can contrast that with what's called the Jerusalem Church. Now, this was the actual disciples of Jesus. Yes. And how they practiced and what they believed. And there were decided differences between these two groups. But over time, because of geopolitical considerations, the different branches of Christianity were sort of systematically eliminated one by one. And when that was done, uh, unfortunately, that was done often at the expense of destroying uh, books that were once considered scripture by some of these branches of Christianity. So a lot of knowledge was lost in the destruction of these books. But these are the, the two fundamental reasons uh, why I left the Christian ministry. It really boiled down to an issue of personal integrity. Mm -hmm. You know, how can I stand behind the pulpit on Sunday morning and preach a sermon that I knew was at variance with the actual taproot of Christianity? Of course, if I stood behind the pulpit on Sunday morning and preached what I had been taught in seminary, I'd be looking for a new job within a week. Yeah. So this conflict existed. And as a result, uh, to preserve my personal uh, integrity, I left the active ministry and, and pursued graduate school in clinical psychology. And by the way, approximately half of my graduating class from Harvard Divinity School walked away from the parish ministry upon graduation. So I wasn't the only one. Is this kind of like the, have you heard of Bart Aram? Yes, yes. Kind of, of people also who have gotten engrossed and really started to go deeper into studying the original text and many of them, they come to the conclusion that you have that, you know, a lot of this uh, is not making sense. It doesn't fit. Sure, sure. And, and uh, you know, the uh, biblical scholar you mentioned is, is a good example of that. But there are many others as well. Um, can, you, can you name a few that pe some people who are out there, the academics, who they recognize these people, these names? Uh, well, Bart Ehrman is, is certainly one. Uh, but it's really almost any good mm -hmm. biblical scholar. Yeah. Knows. I mean, all you have to do is pick up a good Bible commentary, yeah. such as the Interpreter's Bible Commentary, and begin reading it. Yeah. And you'll be exposed in the process to, wait a minute, this text originally read this way, and this was inserted into the text around the year 380 in Spain. This sort of information is there. It's available to the public, but they have to really go out and study in order to find it. That's the thing. How many actually want to take the time to investigate instead of just blindly going along with what everyone else is going along yeah, with. Yeah, and it does take a great deal of time Yeah, to try and do it on your own. Uh -huh. Tell us, did you feel now, before we move forward with the mm -hmm. story, did you feel before you were engrossed with all this new knowledge that you were impervious to someone else coming in with other beliefs, views, opinions? Were you really staunch in your belief that it was unshakable? before you got all this new knowledge? Sure, I, I mean, I had believed what I had been taught in church and Sunday school, mm -hmm. uh, probably just like everyone else believes what they're taught in church and Sunday school. 
Um, and so it is a, it's, it's a real shock when all of a sudden you're confronted with a text uh, that says, um, you know, in, in these verses of the Bible, uh, if you look at the original text, it raises real questions as to whether or not Jesus was actually crucified. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's a shock. Tell us also, who are you emulate? Who did you feel you... We all are emulating somebody. We have role models. Who are you before emulating? Who are you trying to... Were you trying to be like Jesus? Were you trying to be like a certain pastor, a preacher? Well, there, there are certainly ministers who had an influence on me. Mm -hmm. um, and ministers to, to whom I, I looked up and, and admired. Uh, certainly the role model of, of Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, as is presented in, in the four Gospels of the Bible, mm -hmm. is a very powerful and very positive role model. Yeah. Uh, so that was always there as well. Yeah. Tell us now, this is very interesting, it's intriguing, I'm sure people's ears are glued to the screen. There's one thing I just wanted to, to uh, have you comment on, because we want this, those sincere and honest people who are really wanting to know the truth, we want them to be able to understand this, but there are some people who sometimes they just can't get past certain things, mm -hmm. and they're looking at your beard. <laughs> <laughs> we want them to get past the beard. Okay. Tell us about the beard for a second. Well, uh, the beard for me is simply following the example uh, of Prophet Muhammad, uh, who advised us uh, in a hadith, or in a, one of his sayings, that, that we shouldn't trim the beard, that we yeah. should let the beard grow. So um, with that advice from the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, I let my beard grow. Didn't Jesus have a beard? Well, we assume so. Didn't Moses have a beard? Well, we assume so. Beards, beards were uh, fashion uh, yeah. at that time, at that part of the world. Yeah, fashion has changed for people, but for what God has ordained through his messengers as the teachers, they were the ones that we should be emulating, yes. isn't it? Yes, yeah. that, that is what remains stable. So this is just a pious example of somebody trying to emulate the best of human beings, these prophets, Yes. would you say? Okay, so I hope <laughs> that one person or two, they got past the beard. Now, tell us, did you believe earnestly, with full conviction, that the Bible was the Word of God Almighty before, again, you got engrossed in all this new knowledge? Well, I, I think we have to define what's meant by the Word of God, because yeah. there, there's two main beliefs that run throughout Christianity, mm -hmm. if, if you look at different Christians. There's one group of Christians, primarily those uh, who call themselves fundamentalists or, or the far wing of the Christian right, who believe that the Bible is word for word, the literal words of God. But there's a second group of Christians. Mm -hmm. Typically you find them amongst mainline Protestants and Roman Catholics, etc., who say, well, the Bible was inspired by God, but it was funneled through human beings. And so their personal historical context, etc., we have to take that into account. But the basic message, the inspiration, is from God, even though we can't take things literally word for word. Mm -hmm. So you believe this, actually? Yes. yes. Okay, and now, did your, obviously, belief change once you finished seminary school? Oh, absolutely. What did you think then? Well, again, when you're, when you're confronted with the variances in what the original text said and what the Bible says now as you read it, uh, as I said before, that, that's a shocking experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and it causes one to question. Mm -hmm. You know, what else is here that has been changed where I don't have the original text yes. anymore? So I don't know that this change has taken place. Yeah. You know, it's, we know what we know. But how many other places there may have been changes, we don't know. Now, did you lose a lot now? We're going to get into it. And, mm -hmm. and again, people want to know the big question. Why? Why did you accept Islam? Why did you come to be a Muslim? We're going to get to that. Okay. We just want to lead to that. Did you ever get people who came to you with a confused look on their face about this trinity? Wanting <laughs> to know a little more adamantly how they could make this fit. God being obviously three in one, is that correct? Father, Son, and the Ghost, but not three, but one. And somebody just came to you and said, uh, Pastor, uh, did they call you, f uh, what, what was the title? They call you Pastor uh, Pastor Dirks? Reverend. Pastor Dirks, can you please explain to me? I can't figure this out. Who do I pray to? Do I pray to 
-hmm. the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost? Did you have these experiences? Not that often. And, and the reason mm -hmm. for that, again, is, you know, people are taught in Sunday school, they're taught in church from a very early age. You know, God is three persons in one substance. Mm -hmm. That's the traditional Protestant and Roman Catholic formulation of the Trinity. Uh, some of the Eastern churches say three substances in one essence. Yes. But this becomes a catchphrase, three persons in one substance. Mm -hmm. You don't think about it. You don't question it. It's just sort of an automatic response. If you're asked about the Trinity, you say, oh, three persons in one substance. Three persons being the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And so people tend to accept this because it was ingrained at a very early age. Mm -hmm. They tend not to question it or say, now wait a minute, exactly what does that mean? Mm -hmm. um, and when people do, those few who do, typically they find that they can't make any sense out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, Athanasius, who was in many ways the father of the doctrine of the Trinity, is reported to have said uh, very late in life as he was dying that the more he thought about the notion of the Trinity, the less sense it made to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so th this is a very confusing issue, and I think most Christians typically avoid it. Yes. And they just fall back on that early learning of saying three persons in one substance, and if there's any questioning that goes beyond that, the response is, well, that's one of the divine mysteries. What about the egg shell, the yolk, or the water, and it being three components, one part? Have you gotten this? Oh, the, the sort of thing about uh, compare the Trinity to... Uh, uh, H2O, which yes. would be steam, water, or ice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've gotten that. The interesting thing is that's actually officially a heresy mm -hmm. in uh, traditional Christian thought uh -huh. um, because you're, you're denying the three persons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Most Christians who try to grapple their way to some understanding of the Trinity that goes beyond simply saying, three persons in one substance, without realizing it, often drift off into what the church has already condemned as heresy in terms of their understanding of the Trinity. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Wow, this is amazing. We are almost out of time for this session. We're going to have to do a part two. We, let's get a, a, a few more questions in. Mm -hmm. Again, we're excited and we want to know like what led up to finally accepting Islam, but we want to dig a little more to find <laughs> out some of the things, the unique experiences that you, that you had. Did you used to sing? No, I no. You see a lot of singing going on. Ter today. Terrible sense of pitch. <laughs> okay. Now tell us, uh, what did you believe now? You found these things. You went yeah. from believing that this, the Bible, which you were uh, brought up, reading, mm -hmm. studying, learning, was the Word of God, correct? And now mm -hmm. you go through this. Now what did you believe? Did you believe that there was still some of the Word of God in it and it was uh, man's uh, uh, adding, deleting? Yeah. Yeah, certain, certainly I believe there, there was divine inspiration in the Bible in places. Yeah. I also realized that there were corruptions of the Bible in mm -hmm. places. I believe very strongly that there was God, yes. and only one God, uh, but I had no belief in the divinity of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. I had no belief in uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. I had serious questions about the crucifixion event. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, basically, from the time I left the active ministry in 1974 until I became a Muslim many years later, what I called an atypical Christian. Mm -hmm. What's an atypical Christian? Well, for me, atypical Christian is someone who doesn't believe in the divinity of Jesus, who rejects the notion of the Trinity, but still maintains a deep and abiding belief in God, and who still uh, you know, picks up the Bible, reads it for the good moral instruction that is found in it in many places, um, and continues to study mm -hmm. uh, the Bible. Uh, continues, for example, for me, going down to the local seminary and haunting the bookstore and purchasing new books on recent archaeological finds having to do with various texts of the Bible, etc. Did you find yourself getting in some dialogue with other people who believe staunchly that, no, 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 Jesus is God, that he is the son of God also and that he died for your sins since obviously now you didn't you had the antithesis of this you would believe something opposite to it did you have some conflict here with other peers or members of your uh, congregation or friends or 
Well, no, no real conflict. In fact, I didn't attend church uh, yeah. very much at all. This is later on now that you yeah, learned Yeah, once I left the ministry. You know, a few times a year that would be it, primarily because I thought it was an important family function to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but typically I would go, uh, I would listen to a sermon, I would grit my teeth as I heard things I knew were not true. Give us uh, an example. Give us an example. Well, um... The Trinity, yes. uh, for example, or the divinity of Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, or, or some of the statements that were made about the crucifixion or the mm. doctrine of the atonement and the blood. You're sitting there just like, I, how can they preach this? Yeah, this exactly. Is, oh, exactly. This yeah. is amazing. Well, uh, what it is, uh, is, a lot of ministers yeah. uh, rationalize. Uh -huh. And they say, I know what I mean when I say the Son of God, uh -huh. and I understand it this way in sort of a metaphorical way, or I understand it as I believe the actual disciples understood that term, or as it was understood in first century Palestine. However, the congregation probably doesn't yeah. understand it that uh -huh. way when that phrase is said. Did you feel like this also went against your very nature, this inherent nature that God put in all of us to recognize the truth. Did you feel that something inside you said no? Sure, yeah. And do you feel like a lot of people that they, that, you know, you said atypical Christian. I've come across and these are our brothers in, hu in humanity. Yes. And we are to be the kindness to them yes. and we are to share this way of life that we believe that all the messengers of God they lived, which mm -hmm. was surrender and submission, obedience, sincerity, and in peace, which is some of one word, Islam, mm -hmm. to share with them. We don't have to proselytize and you know, try to twist their eyes to accept it, but yeah. if they want to, hey, it's there for you. Sure. It's a way of life that God has ordained for everybody. Take it. If not, you can at least understand us, and we can be brothers working together for some kind of good. Now tell us, before we got like two minutes, and we're going to have to do a part two. This okay. is so exciting. Tell us now, did you feel that you now, because a lot of these people, you said atypical, I'll come across people, like I was saying, that they are Christian, but they don't believe Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. Other people believe that he's son of God, not God. There's some confusion here. Mm -hmm. Did you at any time feel like, you know what, uh, confused now, lost, what do I do? Where do I go from here? Well, I think there are a lot of atypical Christians yeah. out there, actually. Mm -hmm. um, probably more among the ordained clergy than among the laity uh -huh. because the ordained clergy has been exposed typically yeah. to at least some of this information. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was a study done by uh, Psychology Today magazine back in the early 1970s, yeah, I think it awesome. was, where they listed what they considered to be ten fundamental beliefs of Christianity. And they went out and surveyed the Christian laity and found that on the average, Christian laity believed in about seven, I think it was, of these ten. Yeah. When they surveyed the ordained ministry, they found they believed in about four uh -huh. of the ten. Yeah. So you can see the discrepancy. This is not odd. I, isn't it that, uh, I don't know, maybe in the 70s or 80s that the Anglican bishops, they had come to a unanimous decision that you didn't, to be a Christian, you didn't have to believe that Jesus was God also? Well, I'm, I'm not going to speak for the Anglican bishops. Yeah. They, Oh, this is something that, that I came across. So it's not something odd that people, they also go with what's in their nature and they reject this belief that a man can be God, that Jesus was God, etc. Yeah, that's true of a lot of people who, who I would say are atypical Christians. Yeah, we are out of time. We will, inshallah, inshallah. continue next week doing part two. Good. Because we didn't answer how you stumble, <laughs> how you accepted Submission and surrender yeah. to the one God, nothing in creation, but to the creator who made the sun, the moon, who created Jesus, who Jesus prayed to actually, yes. didn't he? Yes. Okay, we could do the part two? And, yes. Inshallah, I'm okay. excited, and I'm sure you're excited also. Thank you, Jazakallah, hi to my brother, and Jazakallah, hi, thank you so much for being with us. I know you're excited, but you know what? We've got to take a time out. We've come and run out of time, but next week we're going to continue on, and we're going to answer this question, why Islam? You got to hear a little bit about the past, about Dr. Uh, Dirks um, going through Harvard University, going through the seminary and being on the pulpit, filling the crowds with preaching the Bible. But now he's a Muslim and you want to know why. And we're going to bring you his story, inshallah, God willing. Thank you. We'll see you next week here on the Dean Show. Until then, assalamu alaikum. Peace.
be unto you. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لآيات لأولي الألباب الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار 